Amen. Leviticus. Leviticus deals with the the Levites. So we studied last Sunday morning, we studied the priest. The Levites, the priests, their duties, their support, and their garments, which covered a lot of territory in the book of Leviticus. This morning we're going to teach you on the offerings that they offered. There were five of them, okay? And so by the grace of God we will accomplish this. I have an almost impossible, impossible job this morning to do. But with God all things are possible. Okay? Alright, because when you get into the offerings of the priesthood, they are very, very technical. There's a lot of details in it, a lot of technicality in it, a lot of information in it. So y'all pray for me, but I'm trusting God to help me to teach it. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now I have done... uh, some work in this before. I have taught some of this to you before. And I wrote a response paper, some of y'all might be interested in, uh, for a uh, distance learning course in Indiana Bible College um, on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And this particular paper is on the book of Leviticus. David S. Norris was the one that uh, I was honored to have grade the paper. He's now got his Ph.D., so he's a theologian. Uh, But this is many, many years ago. So I'm going to go back in some of this information that I had uh, written in the response paper that I turned into that course and share some of that information with you. So y'all pray for me, okay? Amen. Amen and amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. When we begin to deal with the offerings that were offered under the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, most people do not know this information. They have either neither studied it themselves or they've never taught it, uh, been taught uh, in church because there's a lot that's involved with it, okay? But obviously we need to know what these five offerings, because there were five of them, and we'll do our best to cover them this morning so you'll understand. These five offerings, all of them were fulfilled in the offerings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so when you get in the New New Testament, the central teaching of the New Testament is Jesus Christ, His finished work, okay? His person and His life, His finished work. So when you study the New Testament, you have to go back to the Old Testament and study the offerings because they were central to the worship in the Old Testament. So if you don't understand the offerings that were made in the Old Testament, you will not understand the offering of Jesus Christ. Now some people said, well, why didn't God just come in human form and die on the cross and take care of sin? instead of putting this before that, these animal sacrifices. Because if God had done that, if Jesus had come and died on the cross, you would have never recognized what He was doing. And so God placed before the offering of Jesus on the cross these five offerings that typified and laid out and taught for us what would be fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. Amen? The book of Galatians says that the law is our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Okay? Amen. And then the Bible says in Galatians 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son made of a woman under the law. Okay? So He came as a uh, the fulfillment of all of these sacrifices. So it was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. When you get into the Old Testament, and you study the Old Testament, you will see kings make offerings. You will see prophets make offerings. You will see throughout the Old Testament offerings that are made. And if you don't understand what those offerings were, you will not have an understanding as to what's going on in the passage. 
as these various individuals are making these offerings, okay? So it's important for you to understand for Old Testament purposes as far as New Testament purposes so that when you get to Jesus Christ in the New Testament, it is a given, theologically speaking, a given that you already know these offerings that I'm going to teach you about this morning. It's a given, okay? So that when Jesus comes and fulfills them, you know as a believer, and an individual believer, every detail of the offerings, hallelujah, and how they were fulfilled in Christ. So as I said, it's not taught very often. It's not studied very often. Amen? But it's critical for you to understand if you're to understand what Jesus Christ did for us. Okay? Say amen. amen. All right. There were five offerings, so it's really not too complicated. So I said it's complicated, then I said it's not complicated. There's only five of them. Five of them that you and I have to study and to understand. Okay? And obviously you can take notes if you like. In fact, I would encourage you to take notes uh, so it can help you understand the Bible. Okay? Everybody with me? Alright. So five of them. Okay. Three of them are called uh, sweet savor offerings. Sweet savor offerings. The three that are known as sweet savor offerings are offerings that deal with a person who are, who is already in relationship with God. Okay? And these sweet savor offerings of people who are already in relationship with God are known as the burnt offering, the cereal offering, or as the book of Leviticus calls it in the King James, the meat offering. But what's interesting, it wasn't meat at all. It was a, a meal offering or a cereal offering. Okay? So again, sweet savor offering, burnt offering, cereal offering, and then the third one, the peace offering. Those were made by the people of God that were in covenant with the Lord. They had a relationship with God, okay? And those three offerings, sweet savor offerings, burnt offering, cereal offering, and peace offering, were all voluntary. You brought these to God because you wanted to worship God in some special way, alright? The other two offerings, known as the sin offering and the trespass offering, say trespass offering, were known as non-sweet savor offerings. Those two offerings were offered by somebody who had sinned against God. So therefore, they could be a person that's out of covenant with God, not in relationship with God, and so they would bring what is known as the sin offering, which dealt with the wrongness of the person. It deals with that evil nature. Okay, we'll get into that in a moment. And then the second one that would be brought would be known as a trespass offering. The trespass offering in the non-sweet savor offerings was an offering that was brought that dealt with the actual acts of sin. So the sin offering dealt with the sin nature of the person. The trespass offering dealt with the sin, the acts that the person had committed against God, and oftentimes that also included something that a person did wrong to another individual. That's why it's called a trespass offering. Okay? Everybody with me? Alright. So the sweet savor was not commanded. The burnt, the cereal, peace offering, not commanded. But that was done voluntarily by the believer who wanted to do something in recognition of their dedica dedication, commitment to God. The non-sweet offering, sin offering, trespass offering were demanded by God. Okay? Now, if you were not in relationship with God, if you were not in covenant with God, uh, and if you had committed some sin against the covenant, then the sin offering and the trespass offering took, took precedence over the other three. Which means they got you right with God. The sin offering and the trespass offering got you right with God. If you weren't right with God, then you can't bring the burn offering, the cereal offering, or the peace offering because those were brought by people who were right with God. Okay? 
So if you weren't right with God, the first thing you would do, you would bring the sin offering, and in connection to the sin offering, that trespassing trespass offering demanded by God in order to get right with God. That would take precedence over the other. And then you could offer the burnt, the cereal, and the peace offering because you're now right with God and in relationship with God. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Okay, I repeated a lot of that for those of you who are taking notes. Amen. Now, when these offerings were made then, there was a shedding of blood. The only one of the five, uh, it's called the cereal offering, obviously there's no blood in cereal. There's no blood in grain. There's no blood in corn. Right? But the cereal offering had to be offered with a blood sacrifice. And we'll explain that in just a moment. Okay? So anyway, blood in particular is what you see being shed in these five offerings. Well, why was blood shed? What was the purpose of the shedding of blood? Let's go to Leviticus 17 and verse 11. Praise the Lord. Everybody with me? Okay. 17.11. I'm still in the book of Leviticus. This is a verse that deals with everything concerning blood. Okay. Verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So the first thing we see uh, in all things concerning blood and why blood must be shed, the first thing we need to see is that God is the one that provided the sacrifices. God gave it to the people in His grace, His mercy, and His love. He provided the sacrifices for the people. Obviously, they didn't make the animals. Obviously, they didn't produce the corn for the cereal offering. God is the one that provided the sacrifices. So God says, I have given it to you. So it was the grace of God that provided these sacrifices for mankind. First and foremost, extremely important for you to see that. Oftentimes, when we worship God or we serve God, we have a wrong concept of God. And the concept that we have, we still carry it from the dark ages, is that God is some kind of mean, cruel God. Amen. You know, the pagans used to worship these kinds of gods that were mean and cruel gods. And uh, those pagans oftentimes, they would offer sacrifices because they recognized that they needed to bring a sacrifice even to those pagan gods. And they would shed blood, the blood of animals, even the blood of human beings to appease the wrath of those pagan deities because they were mean. And they were cruel. Okay? And the only way to stop them from being mean and cruel is to offer a sacrifice. So the people would bring them. You go to uh, Taiwan. Over there in Taiwan, you'll see those gods. They're mean and they're cruel. Their faces, the dragon gods, you know. Mean and cruel gods. And, and so anyway make a long story short, even the pagans brought sacrifices, but they brought sacrifices to mean and cruel gods. Now keep this in mind, because the gods that they served were mean and cruel, then the people who served those gods were mean and cruel. But when you come to the one God of the Bible, the only true God, Amen? He's not mean and cruel. Amen? 
He's a God of grace and mercy and love. In fact, that doesn't mean that He won't judge people for sin. But the Bible says His wrath, His judgment is His strange work. Because the God that you and I serve is a good God. He's a merciful God. He's a gracious God. He's a loving God. And so as a result, already we find something different about the God that you and I serve, the Israelite God of the Old Testament. That He actually provided the sacrifices that He required to be brought to Him. In kindness and mercy and grace and love, God said, I'm going to provide this so you can approach Me. Because primarily these five uh, offerings was man's approach to God. Now when we get into the festivals, that's man living and walking with God. But the sacrifices deal with man's approach to God. And so because God is good and loving and kind and merciful, He provided those sacrifices for man to approach Him. And so when you and I begin to worship Jesus Christ, the one true God of the Bible, the God uh, to whom these offerings were made, we know God is a God of love and mercy and grace. He's a God of compassion. And because we serve that kind of God, that's the kind of people that we should be. We should not be mean-spirited and, and cruel kinds of people. Because God is the kind of God He is. You worship Him, you'll become like Him. Because you will become like the God that you worship. And so as I said at the beginning, is oftentimes because of the dark ages, we still have this false concept of God. That God is angry at me every day. Every time I, every morning I get up, I know, oh God, I'm afraid of you. You know? Because God, you're mad at me today. I know you're mad at me today. You know? But that comes from the dark ages. That's a wrong concept of God. When you get up in the morning, the Bible says what? His mercies are renewed. Hallelujah. But, but, but we still, as a people, we still, I still carry some of that. You still carry some of that idea about a cruel, mean, vindictive God. Amen. So we have to change our concept of God. It's only when we violate His Word, sin against God, and are rebelling against the Word of God, then He's going to judge us or chastise us. But He does even the chastising in correction. In love, He does that correction in love. Hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. So this morning, I'm not going to get you to lift your hand, but how many of you, when you got up, you thought God was mad at you? In fact, some of you came to church today because you wanted God to get happy with you. I want God to be happy with me, so I'm going to go to church today. Because God is mad. He's frowning. He's angry. He's vindictive. He's trying to find a way to kill me. No. That's not the God that I serve. And that's not the God that you serve. And if you don't see God that way, I'm preaching it to you this morning because some of you say, well, He don't preach grace. See, no, you only come in here and hear what you want to hear. That's your problem. Okay? And so you come in here and I can look at your face and I can tell what kind of God you serve. Amen. You can look at my face and you can tell what kind of God that, that I serve. Because if you come in here and you all frown and you know you all mean spirited all, you, all the time, not just part, all the time, then I know you are serving a different kind of God. Because the God I serve provided for you a sacrifice in grace and love and mercy in His kindness so that you and I could approach God. And it's typified here in this passage. So for all you who come in here constantly and you sit down with frowns and scowls on your face, tells me, you claim, to, you, claim you tell your pastor, I believe in the grace of God. I believe that God is a God of grace and I wish you'd stop preaching law. You tell me that, but then you come and sit there like you do. See, you preach one thing with your mouth, but you live a different one. 
Yeah, I'm coming after you. You better believe I'm coming after you. Because see, here's the thing. Sometimes I'll, I'll preach as a pastor. And then sometimes I'll preach as a prophet. And a prophet will always come after your old Adamic nature. Give the Lord praise in the house. So when you and I understand who God is, it will affect your whole life. Your concept of God. It will affect your face. Hallelujah. The glory of God will be seen on your face. You'll have a smile on your face. The joy of the Lord will be in your heart. Hallelujah. Why? Because God is a great God. God is a good God. And I've come to tell you that. Now you, you get on the wrong side of God. And if I get on the wrong side of God, that's something you don't want to do. Because then you'll experience not a countenance that's lifted up, but you'll lift a, you'll, you'll experience God frowning and judging because He's that as well. Say, praise the Lord. But the first thing we need to see about everything concerning blood is that God is the one in His goodness and mercy that provided that sacrifice for us so that we could approach Him and we could be in fellowship with Him. Somebody said, praise the Lord. When people look at your life or they look at my life, do they see that kind of God? Because you become like the God that you worship. If your concept of God is wrong, you're going to be all wrong. That's why some churches you go to and uh, they still play in, you know, the music and they do the chants and, mm, man, it's so, bo- it's so monotone. I mean, it's like, even in a regular service, not a funeral, but even in a re- regular service, it feels like death. Everything's played in the minor key. You know why? It goes back to the dark ages. Jesus Christ came into the world and He brought everything out of the minor key into the major key. It's supposed to be a celebration time. It's supposed to be a happy time. It's supposed to be a victorious time. But you can go into some churches and they're still playing in the minor key and they're doing their chantings. And it's like, God is dead. No, God's not dead. He's alive. So when we come into His presence, enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. If you're right with God, you can do that. But if you're not right with God, God also provided a way through the non-sweet savor offerings, the the sin offering and the trespass offering to get right with God. And once you get right with God, then you can offer the burn offering, the cereal offering, and the peace offering. Isn't God good? Now tell your face. See, he knows it's not until you get up here do you see stuff. I mean, when he first got up here, it shocked him what he, what he, you know, what he saw. I see it all the time. I get to look at your pretty faces all the time. It's, yeah, you, if you come up here just, just for five minutes and you were to sit here and look at what I look at, it would shock some of you. Amen. But I'm telling you about a God that is so good. He didn't have to, but He provided a sacrifice by which you and I can approach Him and worship Him. Say hallelujah. That's the first thing you need to know about God. Because if you don't know that about God, again, you become like the God that you worship. If you worship the God of murder, you're going to be a murderer. You understand what I'm telling you? Alright, say praise the Lord. Now the next thing about blood, all things blood, that I want you to see is for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it's the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul or a covering for sin. Atonement means covering. A covering for sin. And so it's the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I don't understand that. I don't understand it. I don't know, I don't know of anybody that does understand it. But if my blood leaves my body, my life goes out with it. My soul, somehow, my soul and your soul, your life principle is connected to your blood. So if your blood goes out of your body, your life goes with it. Don't know how that, I don't understand it. Don't know how it does, but it does. 
If my blood is removed from this body, you could come up here and you can kick me. Hallelujah. But I'm not going to move. Because as soon as the blood left the body, the life of the flesh is in the blood. As soon as the life leaves your body or leaves the animal's body, the life of that animal is in that blood. Say praise God. The eye that you call me is in the blood. So when the blood leaves my body, I leave the body. Amen. It's me that leaves the body. And I don't know how, but God said it. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And so God provided those sacrifices because man had sinned against Him. And the blood is where the life is. And God says the wages of sin is what? Is death. So, because we had sinned against God, God provided a substitute. He would have required my life for my sin. Or your life for your sin. But God said, no, in my goodness and in my grace, I'm going to supply a substitute life for you. And so they would bring these offerings. Amen. These five offerings. And again, even the cereal offering had a blood sacrifice connected to it. And the person who brought the offering, the burnt offering, etc., placed his hands on that, on that offering. And it will become a substitute for that person's life. They would take that animal, and he said, that's cruelty to animals. They would kill that animal. But it wasn't cruel. When they killed that animal, those priests were expert in what they did. That they'd walk up to that animal and they would, they would cut its throat in such a way that animal didn't feel any pain whatsoever. Amen. Not none. Not no, no pain. When Jesus Christ came into the world and died on that cross, it was different. Jesus Christ did not just die. Jesus Christ experienced cruel, beaten, suffering, pain. He experienced pain. But the animal didn't. The mercy and grace of God. Those priests knew exactly how to kill that, those sacrificial animals so that those animals would not suffer at all. They were experts in doing it. And so, a person would bring that substitute, that offering, by which he could approach God. But because he or she had sin in his life to begin with, there had to be the death of the animal. Amen. And so as soon as that substitute, the hands were placed on that substitute, and I'll talk about what that means in a moment, that animal was killed and the blood flowed out of its body. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And so when the blood flowed out of the body of that animal, the life of the animal flowed out with it. And God said, I'll recognize this substitute. A life for a life. And I'll accept an animal to die in your place so you don't have to die for sin. That's the grace and the mercy of God. So He provided the sacrifices and He said it's life for life because you and I, amen, deserve to die. We deserve, because of sin, original sin and our own personal sin, we deserve to die. But God provided a sacrifice. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And it's the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The blood, life for life. Amen. And God recognized it. And what's interesting is the animal is amoral. The animal is amoral. The animal in itself is not good or bad. The animal doesn't have a sin nature. It's not good or bad. It's, it's amoral is what the term is. Amoral. Not good or bad. When you look at an animal and you say, good dog. Or you say, bad dog. Well, it's really not a bad dog. Amen. Because it doesn't know the Ten Commandments. 
It, it, it doesn't know the Ten Commandments. It doesn't have, know how to obey the Ten Commandments. It, it's not responsible to God to obey the Ten Commandments. So it's not a moral creature. Amen. So you got an animal that's not good or bad that's being become a substitute for people who are moral people. That means you, by choice, hallelujah, you have moral responsibility before God to obey His commands, to obey His words, because you're not an animal. I know there's some people that want to call you an animal. They, 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 you know, they said you came from a monkey. And you're nothing better than an animal. I know some people want to tell us that, but you're not an animal. Amen. Hallelujah. Give God. You're a man. Amen. You're mankind. Amen. You're unique from the animals. And so because God created you in His image, unlike the animals, He didn't create the animals in His image. He created you in His image. You're not an animal. You're mankind. And so you are a moral creature because God created you in His image. Hallelujah. Which means you have the ability to make choices in your life for good or bad. And God calls you and I to obey the commandments of God. But God allowed an animal that's amoral, no choice, can't obey the commandments of God, has no responsibility to do so. God allowed that animal, amen, to die in your place, the place of a moral creature who knows right from wrong, amen, has a moral responsibility before God. God allowed that, but notice the Bible says it would only atone for your soul. The word atonement means to cover. So all these Old Testament animals that were brought to God, whether they be the uh, sweet savor offerings of people who in fellowship with God or non-sweet savor offerings, the sin and trespass offering to get us right with God, all of these sacrifices that were made could only cover the lack in our life or the sin that was in our life. They could not take them away and the Hebrews knew that. The priests knew that. The people knew that. They knew that these animals could not take your sin away. They could only cover them. And so, when these sacrifices were made, it covered the sin. Atonement. Somebody said, at one moment. Atonement. It makes you at one with, at one moment with God in a relationship with God. Amen. But literally, atonement means to cover the sin. So every day, sacrifices were made every day. Sweet savor sacrifices, burn offering, cereal offering, peace offering by people who just said, I love you, God. I'm in relationship with you. And then the sin offering and the trespassing offering. Trespass offering says, God, I need to get right with you. Every day, these offerings were made by the people. Can you imagine that? How much blood of how many animals were shed through the years? Amen. Every day this would be going on in the Old Testament. The killing of the animals, the shedding of the blood, day after day after day. And all they were was a credit card. That's all they were. They just covered the sin. They couldn't pay the price for sin. They just covered over it. So man could approach God. Day after day after day, that credit card was charged and charged and charged and charged. Amen? And all these IOUs every day accumulated through the year. So literally hundreds of thousands of IOUs, credit card charges all year long by people who had brought these offerings that could just cover the offering but couldn't pay the price. Couldn't take it away. All those IOUs in the year by these sacrifices came to head in one IOU on the Day of Atonement. When all the sins of the nation was placed on the head of a goat, 
And that goat was slain. And then another goat called the scapegoat let the sins of the people out of the camp. So all those IOUs, all those credit card charges through the year is now combined into one credit card charge on the Day of Atonement. You know, it's sort of like God says, okay, you maxed out your credit cards through the year, so I'm going to give you another credit card, and we're just going to combine. Have y'all ever done this? Some of y'all have charged this card, you've charged that card, you've charged this card. you got four or five cards, you've charged up to the max. And then somebody calls you on the phone and says, you know what, we can take all of your debt and combine it into one. Oh, it sounds good. So you combine it into one, and then all those cards that you had charged to the max are now open. The problem is, most of the time, you go and charge all those cards back up again, so you got this one, and you got all those again again. But the point being, in the Old Testament, that all of those charges through the year that you had made, that the price wasn't paid, just covered, you know, just covered over, pushed it forward a little bit, pushed it forward to the Day of Atonement. And it's like God said, okay, you've maxed all your credit cards for the year. On the Day of Atonement, I'm going to take all those credit cards, combine them into one. Amen. So we won't have all of these IOUs laying around. we got one for the nation. But then we have year by year by year by year. Leviticus 16 will talk about the Day of Atonement. You can read it on your own. Year by year by year. All of those credit cards that have been maxed now combined into one. But that one becomes another one the next year and another one the next year and another one the next year. And so that even at that, in God's grace and God's mercy, having all the credit cards maxed out through the year and then combined it into one IOU at the Day of Atonement, those one IOUs on the Day of Atonement became more than one IOUs through hundreds of years. And that's what it was in the Old Testament. And so there had to be a debt. There there was a debt. There had to be a price paid, not just to cover it, but to take it away. And Jesus Christ comes into the world, the Bible tells us, in the fulfillment of all these sacrifices. And He dies on that cross. And His blood, not the blood of an animal, but the blood of the life of a man for the life of man. His blood was shed, and when His blood was shed, His life went out in that blood. His life for my life. But the difference now is not that it was just covered from year to year, as in the Old Testament, and pushed forward. Now Jesus Christ comes and dies on that cross and pays the price for that sin and doesn't just cover my sin. He takes it all away. It's like somebody, if you were in the Old Testament, said all of these credit cards you maxed up that you turned into one loan and then you did it again every year. A donor shows up and says, we're not going to leave it on the credit card. I'll be the donor. I'll pay for it. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you. Can you imagine all the IOUs that were stacked up through the hundreds of years? But God in His mercy and grace says, we'll just push it forward a little bit. We'll push the debt of sin forward a little bit. And as long as you look to Calvary when you brought that animal as an Israelite, as long as you looked at the promise, Genesis 3.15, that God made there at the fall of man, that that the seed of the woman would come and brush crush the head of the serpent, as long as you believed in that Genesis 3.15 passage, that God would come, would send the seed of the woman, and He would crush the head of the serpent, As long as you look forward to that prophetic event when you brought those animals, God said, I'll count it for you. I'll put it on your credit. Until He, whose right it is, comes and dies on that cross and wipes the debt, cancels the debt, takes it all away. And that's the difference between what Jesus Christ did and those sacrifices in the Old Testament did. No Hebrew... Israel, no priest ever believed that those animal sacrifices took away sin. Amen. But you can study the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews 
is the commentary. Listen carefully. I'll say it slowly. The book of Hebrews is the New Testament commentary on what I'm preaching to you today. So you'll understand it. Okay? Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So I'm glad today because of God's grace and His mercy to us where He provided Himself a sacrifice because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And it's the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And that's God's grace and mercy. Hallelujah. Now, we look back to Calvary. In the Old Testament, they look forward to Calvary. Say praise the Lord. Now, the next thing we need to know, as we've looked at Leviticus 17.11, all things concerning blood. If you didn't have a blood sacrifice, you couldn't approach God. But it was God's goodness and mercy and grace that provided a way by which we could approach Him. Because remember, the Israelites had already broken the Ten Commandments. When you get to this point, God said, I'm going to, pro I'm going to provide a way for you to be back in fellowship with me. I'm going to provide a way for you to come in to my presence. Hallelujah. Give the Lord worship in this house. Okay? The next thing we need to talk about before we get into these five sacrifices is the laying on of hands. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about it as being one of the principal doctrines of our faith. The laying on of the hands. The ABCs. In case you don't know it, what I'm teaching you today, even though at times it may seem complex because of all the details, is the ABCs of your faith. Hebrews chapter 6 says one of the ABCs of your faith is the laying on of hands. It goes back to the Old Testament. They bring those animals that were going to be a substitute for them. And either the people or the priest, depending on the sacrifice, would place their hands on the head of that animal. And, and you know, we talked about it last Sunday that when the high priest lifted his hands, it was as if he was putting something on the people. When he pronounced the blessing, he was putting it on the people. So now when you bring that sacrifice and you put your hands on the head of that sacrifice, you are literally leaning into that sacrifice. You are as if pushing your sin or whatever you're trying to communicate of yourself to that animal. It's to put upon the animal. The laying on of hands means two things. Number one, it means identification. So that when you place that hand, your hands on that animal, that animal is identifying, now has become your identification. It's become in place of you. Identification. The second thing that that laying on of hands teaches us is communication. You're putting something <coughs> on the animal. You're communicating something to that animal. Amen. For example, in the New Testament, when you come and somebody lays hands on you, what's happening? The same thing that happened in the Old Testament. When those people put their hands on that animal, they were communicating their power on that animal. When In the New Testament, when you come and hands are laid on you, there is a communication. Whatever's in that man or that woman, whatever power is in that person, when you come and you have somebody lay their hands on you, there's a communication that's taking place that what is inside of that person is now being put upon you. And it's as if we're leaning into you. And But now we pray in the name of Jesus. And it's not our power. It's, it's, it's not our presence. But when we pray for you, we're releasing the power and the presence of God. We're communicating that to you. Hallelujah. So we see in the Old Testament a doctrine, the laying on of the hands of the apostles. There's a communication of power. 
that takes place when that is done. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. So that's, that's the way they, you know, uh, did it. They made that animal by the laying on of hands the substitute. Give the Lord praise. Now, before we break it down into detail, let me talk to you about, first of all, the offerings briefly. And again, these are found in the first eight chapters of the book of, Le- book of Leviticus. Okay? You with me? Okay. Now, the first offering that Leviticus starts with, let me go there, so you'll know I'm, I'm still in the Bible. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him, out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. And if his offering be a burnt sacrifice, stop. So God starts with the sweet savor offerings. Not the sin offering, not the trespass offering. He doesn't start with the non-sweet savor offerings, the ones that are commanded for the sinner to become right with God. He starts, isn't it interesting, with the sweet savor offerings, voluntary offerings that are brought by people who were already in covenant with God. That's how he starts with, okay? And the first one he talks about is going to be the offering. The next one he talks about is the cereal offering. The third one he will talk about is the peace offering. Verse 1, the burn offering. The burn offering is an animal. It's brought. Now, when you study uh, a little bit more detail about the daily burnt offering that was offered, we covered this last Sunday. Amen. And this would be found in the 8th chapter, beginning with verse 14. No, I'm sorry, that's the sin offering. Let me me back up here. In the 6th chapter, excuse me, verse 8. This is the burnt offering. This is the first one that's mentioned in Leviticus 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the what? burnt offering it is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it say praise the Lord now that the Bible talks about is something that is done every day by the priest on the behalf of the people there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice Which means basically you've got a 24-hour burning that's, that's going on. We talked about that last Sunday. Now, <clears throat> this offering again, we'll get into more detail about it as to what kind of animals could be brought. But this offering, the burnt offering, speaks of devotion. When a person... And, and again, now you listen, need to listen carefully. The, the burn offering was made by the priest on the behalf of the nation every morning and every evening. But if you as a believer in covenant with God wanted to show God how much you loved Him and you wanted to show God how committed you were to Him, how devoted you were to Him, you would bring that burn offering to God. And it would be something extra. It would be something beyond. It would be something uh, uh, special that would be, be also something that you as an individual brought in light of the fact that every day the burnt offering was done for you by the priest. But if you wanted to do something special, and you wanted to show God, I'm devoted to you, God. I'm committed to you. You would bring that, that animal and offer it as a burnt offering. And you would place your hands on that animal and you would kill that animal. The priest would catch the blood. 
you would cut the animal up. You would flay it. Flay it. You would flay it. You would cut it up. And the priest would take it and put it on the altar. The burnt offering. So not only was the burnt offering made every day, evening, morning and evening on behalf of the people, but this was something that you wanted to do on your own. To show your devotion and commitment to God Almighty. Say praise the Lord. The whole animal. The whole animal was burned totally. No portion of it was eaten. It was a total giving. And so what you were saying as an individual was you were saying I'm giving my whole self to God. Now, if you brought that animal, that burnt offering, and you laid your hands on it, and the animal was killed, and, and then that animal was sacrificed, and then you walked off, and you lived like the devil, then that burnt offering that you offered that morning meant absolutely nothing. Because they knew, if you want, if you want scripture for that, read Isaiah chapter 1. God got to a place where He was talking to Israel and they kept bringing sacrifices and He said, I don't want any more of this. He said, away with it. And the reason why, I mean, He's the one that provided it for them. But the reason why He said, get rid of it, I don't want it anymore was because when they went to church and they brought all these offerings, they thought it was just going through the motion that made them right with God. And as long as they brought an, an animal, and, then, okay, I'm good now with God. So I can go and live like I want to without repenting. I can go and live like I want to without confessing. So really, they missed the whole point that the animal was representing them giving themselves to God. If you walked up and you gave that offering and you didn't really give yourself to God, it became a stench in the nostrils of God. So they brought that offering. They said, when they made that offering to God, I'm giving you my to whole self, my total person. Lord, I belong to to you. And when they killed that animal and that animal was offered to God and that smoke went up on their behalf as if it, their life went up into the presence of God and God received it. They're saying, Lord, this is me. So when I walk away this morning having offered the offering that speaks of total devotion to God, they were saying, that's my life, Lord. I'm giving you my total life today. And that's what that offering represented. Hallelujah. It was a commitment that they made to God. Their whole being. Amen. The next one in the chapter 2 of the book of Leviticus. The next offering that is, we read about is the, the cereal offering. That cereal offering spoke of the life of the person. The life of the person. Amen. And they bring, <clears throat> and we'll break it down for you when we, when we have the opportunity to do so. Or they bring, <clears throat> they would get corn. They'd go in the field and they'd get a, they'd get a piece of corn and the corn had to be full, full of grain. It, it couldn't have, you know, missing kernels. <laughs> it had to be full of grain. And they'd take that, that grain. And they'd heat it up and crush it in the fine flour. Send it through a sieve to make sure there's no lumps in it. I mean, that flour was like powder when they got through with it. And then they would take that and mix it up with, with a little bit of oil. The Bible says it talks about frankincense. And 
and mix it all up into cakes. And they would present it to God along with a blood sacrifice. Because remember, it represents life. And you're not presenting perfect life, so you had to have blood with you when you offer this one. And so they would go through that process and that cereal offering, and they were saying, Lord, I'm committing my life to you. The burnt offering, their total being, the cereal offering, a dedication of their inward life. And then the third one. Third chapter of the book of Leviticus, we see this offering. That offering is called the peace offering. God, I love you so much. I want to offer to you the sacrifice of praise. So the third offering speaks of worship. They would come before the Lord and because they wanted to worship God, they would offer a peace offering. And I'll get into the details of that in just a moment. Worshiping God. It was literally called the sacrifice of praise. So when you come in in Hebrews chapter 13, it talks about God tells us to offer a sacrifice to praise. And we come in here and we lift up our hands. We thank Lord, I'm surrendering to you really doesn't have anything to do with surrender. You know? Okay, if you want it that way, if if we want to talk about the lifting up of hands as being surrendered, have it. You know, somebody said the lifting up of hands, that's a picture of total surrender to God. If you want it that way, have it. But the lifting up of hands was much more than your surrender to God. Because this is what they did when they came and presented the peace offerings to God. This was an animal sacrifice. They would lift it like this before the Lord. With the hands of the priest under their hands, they would lift it and they'd wave it before God. And I'll explain that to you in a minute. That's called the wave offering. And what they were saying, thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. The sacrifice of praise. That's why when you lift your hands, the rabbis said, when they studied the peace offering, they said, this is the only one when Messiah comes that will continue. All the rest of them will be fulfilled. And they will not continue. But the rabbi said when Messiah comes, people will still offer this one offering called the sacrifice of praise or the peace offering. Hebrews 13 tells us that we do that today. So when you lift your hands, you're not saying, I surrender to you, God. You're saying, Lord, I thank you. I worship you. I'm bringing the peace offering to you today. They would wave it from one end to the other. Amen. And we'll talk about what they wave. They wave the breast. We'll get that in a moment. Or they would bring the heave offering connected to the peace offering and the priest would get up underneath their hands and, and heave an offering to God. That was the, the, uh, the sacrifice of praise. Literally called the sacrifice of praise. The peace offering. It was my worship unto God. So the first one, the burnt offering, total commitment of myself, total devotion of myself to God. The second one, the cereal offering, I'm giving my life to God. And the third one is, in the peace offering, I'm giving my worship to God. So I'm lifting my hands, and we'll talk about it in a minute in more detail. But they literally, when they lifted that sacrifice of praise, that peace offering, they would shout praises to God for what He had done for them. And then the fourth offering that you see beginning with the fourth chapter. Amen. I want to make sure I'm giving you the right chapter. <clears throat> yes, fourth chapter begin verse 1 and 2. The, the fourth offering was the sin offering. 
And as I said, if you weren't in covenant with God and your relationship wasn't right with God, this became the first thing you would do. It take precedence over the sweet savor offerings, the other three. Because until I'm right with God, I can't offer devotion to Him. And so the sin offering that the people would bring, Amen. By the way, details are given concerning these offerings beginning with chapter 6, chapter 6 and 7. Okay? That's where I'm getting some of this information I'm giving to you. Most of the information I'm giving to you is right out of the Bible. Okay? But that sin offering, they brought that sin offering to God in order to be in fellowship with God. To get right with God. If you were a priest, if you were a high priest and you sinned against God, you had to bring the most expensive of all the animals to God. You had to bring a young bull. Per square inch, there's no other animal on planet earth per square inch that has more blood than the bull. Because of your position as a high priest, because of your position and responsibility, if you sinned against God, you had to bring the most expensive of all the animals. Because your sin was greater than the sins of other people. In the sense that, because of your position of responsibility and leadership, if a leader sins against God, he affects other people. You and I, if you're a leader today, you sin against God, you affect other people. So because of that, there would be a greater condemnation for the sin of a high priest. So the high priest would have to bring a sacrifice, amen, which was very costly. The animals, bullock, for the high priest, and we'll cover what different types of animals there were for other people. But you need to understand that that sin offering represented the wrongness of the person. Not the acts that they had committed. The sin offering dealt with that old wrongness, that sin nature that was in man. That person, when they brought that sin offering, <clears throat> and they, they recognized that what they were saying to God is, I'm out of fellowship with You, Lord, right now. I'm out of covenant with You right now, Lord. There's sin in my life. I'm wrong. I'm the wrong kind of person. I'm not the kind of person that I should be. So it dealt with being a, the wrong kind of person. God said, I'm going to let you bring a sacrifice of a sin offering that deals with that old sin nature that's on the inside of you because you're the wrong kind of person. So they would bring that sin offering. The high priest sinned. He would offer one particular type of sacrifice of just a saint in the church sinned against God. They'd bring a lesser lesser animal. But it all, everything that was done there was to get back, to get right with God, to get back in fellowship with God because I'm not right and I know I'm not right. But God made a sacrifice for me so I could get right and you could get right with God. And you did that if you sinned against the Lord. Amen. The trespass offering. Beginning of that teaching, the trespass offering, is found in the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 14. That trespass offering dealt with the acts of sin. It dealt with the things that you had done wrong. The acts themselves. Hallelujah. It was called a trespass offering because 
not only were you trespassing against God, but oftentimes the, the sin that you committed affected somebody, some other individual. In that trespass offering, dealing with the acts of sin, you did something wrong to an individual, you trespassed against them. So God says when you bring the trespass offering, He said you bring the offering and <clears throat> it'll be offered for you, but you add <clears throat> restitution money because you've affected somebody else's life. God said you bring a fifth part. You not only bring a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice for your sin, but you, you bring 20% you make restitution for what you did to that person. We got people in the church today. Might be me. I'm a people. Sometimes you offend somebody or you do somebody wrong. And you think in your mind, all I got to do is go to God and confess it to God and say, God, forgive me for hurting so and so. Forgive me for what I've done to that person. And you think it's all good. Because you confessed it to God. You're wrong. Because the trespass offering dealt with restitution. If you did somebody wrong, you not only brought a sacrifice, but you paid that person restitution. You said, I did you wrong, brother. And I'm giving you 20%. I'm restoring. If I stole from you something, I'm bringing back what I stole and I'm adding 20% on top. I don't know where some people get their theology. All, all I got to do is confess it to God and I'm good with God and man. No, this sacrifice deals with your offense toward God and man. You, you rip somebody off, you sitting in the church house today, you go steal something from somebody, you go to God, He's your sacrifice for your sin, you ask Him to forgive you, but when you get through doing that, you take that stolen goods back, and you seek to make restitution for the harm you've done. That's by. That's the trespass offering. So those are basically the five offerings and what they meant to the people. Now the good news is this, Jesus Christ fulfilled all of these for us. Because you and I have never been completely and totally devoted. We've never done our best, so He was the burn offering. And when He came, He offered His life. Thank God He offered His life because His life would not save you. His life, if you say, well, I'm, I'm trying to live like Jesus lived, then you're going to die and go to hell. What I mean by that, if you're not a born again believer, and you're looking at the life of Jesus Christ, the perfect life of Jesus, and you're trying to be saved by mimicking or imitating Him, you're going to die and go to hell because you're not perfect in your life. And that's why the cereal offering had to have a blood sacrifice with it because nobody was perfect in their life when they brought that offering which spoke of their life. Jesus Christ's life condemns you. He condemns me. Every one of us. Amen? But He offered that life for you and I on the cross. And in offering that life, now I have life. He lives His life through me. And because He offered that life, now I can come and I can say, Lord, I give You my life. Live Your life through me as I seek to serve You. And then the third one, fulfilled in Christ, perfect prayer, perfect praise. His life was a life of worship. And you know, Paul says that Christ became a sin, became sin for us. Literally, it could be translated, He became the sin offering for us. 
as far as trespass offering is concerned. I know no. In New Testament, where Jesus was ever ever said to have fulfilled the trespass offering. But I do know that when He died on that cross, He didn't just die for that old sin nature. He died for the acts of my sin. He died for what my sin caused. The pain that my sin caused. The suffering that my sin caused. Amen. First given to God. For God. Jesus, for God. And then, for you. If we look over in 1 John, the good news is this, Jesus Christ died for that old sin nature, but the good news is this. i got a question for you. What if you sin after you become a born again believer? Is it over? Is there no hope for you? Well, look at 1 John 1 and 9. This is where the trespass offering comes in. God is so good, all these were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. First John 1 and 9 says this. Verse 8, let's start there. If we say that we have no sin, that's the sin offering. That deals with the wrongness of the person. The sin he's talking about is the sin nature. If you walk around and say, I don't have a sin nature, you're a liar. Every one of us, even though born again, still have a sin nature. And if you say, I don't have a sin nature and there's nothing wrong with me, you're a liar. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, that's the acts of our wrongness. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. The good news is this. There's times you and I know we're wrong. There's something wrong with us. The wrongness of the person. That's the sin offer. And I look at the acts that I've done and I've sinned against God by those deeds and sinned against people. I seek to make restitution for the wrong I've done. The good news is this, that His blood keeps on cleansing you. If we sin, if we sin, He'll keep on cleansing you if you confess. If you confess that sin, give God praise. Because as I was telling you earlier, this word confession is also a part of the laying on of hands. Because when they laid hands on those animals, they would make a confession. You know what the confession was? They would say, God, You're just. Your justice is beautiful. They would say, Oh God, I don't think You should judge anybody. No, they would make a confession on the behalf of God. God, your judgment is right. God, your justice is right. That was a part of their confession. Lord, and they knew they deserved to die, and they knew God's justice was right. But they said, Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace in forgiving me. Lord, I repent of this sin. I say, God, you're right, and I'm wrong. So if you confess your sin, the Bible says the blood of Jesus just keeps on cleansing you from all unrighteousness. One thing you need to know is that these sacrifices in the Old Testament, there are some, sac there are some sins that a person could commit that you could not bring a sacrifice for. In the Old Testament, you committed adultery. They took you out and stoned you to death. 
In the Old Old Testament, you committed murder. They took you out and stoned you to death. In the Old Testament, if you had rebellion in your life, they took you out. If you were a child, took you out and stoned you to death for your rebellion. Because they saw rebellion was as the sin of witchcraft and you stoned a witch to death. They probably had a lot less problems with youth than we do today. I would think so, don't you? Because there was no sacrifice. You get a rebellious son rebelling against you, he knows his next appointment is with a pile of rocks on him. Maybe we ought to go back to the Old Testament. We'd have a lot less problems. But my point is, there were some sacrifices you couldn't bring a sacrifice for in the Old Testament. But Paul in his writing said there were sac- there was their sin now. And I say sin now, but even sin then. You couldn't bring a sacrifice for, but the blood of Jesus Christ went even beyond those sacrifices and provided forgiveness for forgiveness for even sin that was not provided a sacrifice for in the Old Testament. David knew it. Psalm 55, I think. Let me make sure I got that right. I thank God for helping me this morning. I told you I wasn't going to read all the verses. You're going to have to read them for yourself, all right? You'll read it. You'll see it's there. Psalm. Remember David? How many of y'all remember David? King David? He sinned against the Lord. He sinned against God. He murdered Uriah and committed adultery with Bathsheba. And there was no sacrifice in that Old Testament that God could bring, that, G, that David could bring to God to get right with God. For David, by the law of God, David should have been stoned to death for what he did by the law of God. Amen. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to Thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of Thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before Thee, against Thee and Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in Thy sight. That Thou mightest be justified when Thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. You see, he, he's honoring the judgment and justice of God. He says, it's beautiful. Not like some people. They don't... Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from Thy presence. Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of Thy salvation, and uphold me with Thy free spirit. Then when I teach transgressors Thy ways, sinners shall be converted unto Thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of Thy righteousness. Lord, open Thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth Thy praise, for Thou desirest not sacrifice. Else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. He said, God, for what I've done, there's no sacrifice I can bring. He knew he deserved death for murder and adultery. 
he got a glimpse of Jesus Christ. He got a glimpse of the cross. What Jesus Christ was provided was greater than any in the sac in the, than the sacrifices in the Old Testament. And David reached out and grabbed a hold of the grace of God in the New Testament, brought it into his time, and found forgiveness. Because there was no forgiveness for a high-handed sin. God's good, isn't it? All right. So in closing, go over to the book of Leviticus. Chapter 1, that burnt offering. I'm just going to go through the details real quickly with you. The animals that could be provided for the burnt offering. A bull or an ox. Or a lamb or a goat. The burnt offering, the law, that uh, the first chapter speaks of it. And then... In chapter 6, beginning with verse 8. The burnt offering. Okay, so the ox, the bull, the ox, the lamb, right? Or turtle dove. <clears throat> that burnt offering, as I've already told you, spoke of giving myself to God. The bull, the ox, the lamb, or if you were poor, you could bring turtle doves. Now, I don't have time to read all the verses. I'm just going to teach it to you. Again, I've already covered it, but I'm going to go into more detail. If you brought a bull or an ox, that speaks of service. Again, it speaks about giving myself to God devotion. Now, because you and I, and because they as Israelites were never completely, totally devoted to God, they brought a sacrifice. And in that sense, that sacrifice also atoned for the lack of devotion. So in a sense, atoned for the sin in a sense. Even though it wasn't a sin offering. The sacrifice is saying, I've fallen short of total devotion. And God said, I'll give you a sacrifice because you've fallen short of total commitment. It'll take your place. So if you were rich, you could bring a bull. You could bring a bull speaks of service, ox speaks of service. A lamb, you could read about it in the first chapter. You could bring a lamb. Or you could read about it in the sixth chapter, these details. A lamb speaks of unresisting abandonment to God. You know how a lamb is. Isaiah 53, like a lamb to the slaughter. Jesus, like a lamb to the slaughter. Unresisted abandonment to God. Or you could bring a goat. And the goat was also something that was offered in the sin offering. A goat. Or you could bring turtle doves. Obviously the goat speaks of, of sin offering or sin. You could bring turtle doves if you were poor. Amen. They would take those turtle doves according to the first chapter of the book of Leviticus. And they would take its crop out of its body and strip it of, of its feathers. You could bring that to God if you wanted to. If you were poor, say praise the Lord. But in connection to that, that, that burnt offering sacrifice, the Bible tells us the details. Again, I'm not going to read it. The blood was shed first. And then, according to chapter 1, it was flayed, flayed and cut up into pieces. Okay? You can read that in verse 6 of chapter 1. Obviously, the blood's been shed. Now we're going to flay it and we're going to cut it in pieces. What does that speak of? The flaying speaks of the beatings of Jesus. Okay? They're going to have to rip the flesh up. They're going to have to, they're going to, have to flay the flesh. Speaks of the the beatings of Jesus. And the cutting of the sacrifice into pieces speaks of the, the bloody wounds of Jesus. The nail scarred hands, feet, brow. You know, the wounds of Jesus. Cut the sacrifice up. 
reason why it was flayed and the reason why it was cut up also was so that every part of that sacrifice would be burnt totally. When Jesus Christ hung on that cross, He offered Himself totally and completely to the will of the Father. He was beaten, flayed, typically cut to pieces, wounded for our transgression, and was totally consumed on the fiery altar of God's cross for you and I. They took the insides of that sacrifice. The insides of that sacrifice, obviously you're talking about the heart. You're talking about the character. The character of the sacrifice. They took those inward parts of that sacrifice and they went to that laver. They washed those sacrifices in water. To clean them. Jesus Christ was perfect. He was a clean sacrifice. When He was offered, it wasn't just His outward body, but His inward character was offered to God on our behalf. Sinless per perfection of Jesus Christ is what that speaks of. And then, it says, wash the legs. Wash the legs. It speaks of Jesus' perfect walk. The sinless walk. Not just inward sinlessness, the washing of the inward parts, but the walk of Jesus Christ. Wash the legs. His walk was perfect. Turtle doves, as you read, you brought turtle doves, verse 14, as a sacrifice. Turtle dove, there were many, many turtle doves in that nation. You could find them everywhere. If you were poor, you could bring a turtle dove. It speaks of innocence. It speaks of the innocence of Jesus Christ. They take they take the crop out of that bird, and I don't know if you know this or not, but not all birds have a crop. What a crop is is a filter. It filters all the filth, the bad stuff, out of the food that they eat. The bad stuff in the food they eat, and it. Rejected food of the, of the turtle dove goes into that crop. So that the food that goes into their body is clean. That's why a, a bird that has a crop, it's, it's flesh is good for you. Some anim, some birds don't have that filter system called the crop. They're not good for you. Their flesh is contaminated with filth. They said, take that crop. The Bible tells you. I'll read it to you. Amen. It's to be burnt on the altar. The blood there shall be wrung out outside. And he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers and cast it beside the altar. The animal's killed, obviously. Burned on the altar. It's blood. As the Scripture says there. Is wrung out at the side of the altar. But you take, he said, take that crop. He said, you cast it at the foot of the altar. Because when Jesus Christ comes, there's not going to be any filth in him. And there is no rejected food in Jesus Christ. So you take that crop and you cast it at the foot of the altar. And then you take that bird and you pull all of its feathers off. Because the feathers of the bird speaks of the outward glory of that bird. 
You're going to take and you're going to strip the outward glory off of that bird. When Jesus Christ hung on the cross, the Bible tells us, He hung there naked. They stripped Him of outward glory. So God said, I'll accept that sacrifice. In, in some sense, well, the Bible's very clear about it. He was rich, but for our sakes, He became poor. When He hung on that cross, church, stripped of His glory, naked hanging on that cross, He became shame, a shame for us. There He is, hanging in shame on your behalf. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the perfect Son of God the burnt sacrifice that I'm looking at here. Hanging on a cross publicly made naked for all to gaze upon Him. He died in shame. The ashes were taken outside the camp and put in a clean place. Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 12 through 14, tells us Jesus was crucified with outside the camp of Israel. In that place called Golgotha. And that also speaks of being rejected. It speaks of being cast out. It speaks to be uh, being uh, treated shamefully. In that same Hebrews 13 passage, it tells us, you read it, it tells us now you and I, we go outside the camp bearing the reproach. Jesus Christ went outside the camp, was treated shamefully. You and I, when we serve Him, we're going outside of the camp of society. You will be rejected of people. You will be mocked and you will be made fun of when you really serve the Christ. I know there's some churches you can go to and all they're about is a social gospel. There's no shame. But when you really serve Jesus Christ as a true believer, and you live holy, you live separate and different from the people in this world, you're a follower of Jesus, they're going to mock you because you're bearing His reproach. You and I are not accepted by the people in this world. The moment that you and I, that becomes our total focus, is to be accepted by the people of this world, we're no longer going outside of the camp of society bearing His reproach. There's some people. You might ask yourself, why won't they live for God? Can't figure it out. He's so good. Why won't they go to church? Because they want to be accepted by the world. They don't want to bear the shame that comes with being a Christian. You think people in this world love Jesus Christ, you're wrong. They hate Him. People in this world hate Jesus Christ. Oh, they'll say, sweet Jesus, mocking Him. I told you before, the believer doesn't say, sweet Jesus. The believer says, Lord Jesus Christ. I heard somebody the other day just as a devil as they can be. Obviously, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I know that. But I'm saved. I heard a sinner that doesn't have a desire to live for Christ at all say, sweet Jesus. I'm going, yeah, you're the devil. That's what the world does. They try to bring them into their culture, their sinful way of living. You're going to live for Jesus. I'm going to live for Jesus. Friend, you're not going to be accepted by the world. You're not going to be popular with the world. And that's the problem of some young people. I want to be popular. They quit God, leave the church. And oftentimes find they don't have a friend outside the church either. But they did it because they don't like the reproach. 
So those ashes taken outside of the camp into a clean place. As we give ourselves in total commitment to Jesus Christ, we go forth outside the camp bearing His reproach. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm thankful to be a believer. I'm glad to be a believer. You know, and if some people come in here and say, what kind of believer are you? You go, I'm what, what did you say? I'm, I'm Pentecostal. You're Pentecostal? Because you're so ashamed. Are you one of them holiness kind? Yeah, yeah. You're just so ashamed. No. You need to lift up your head and say, yeah, I'm a believer. I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm a born again believer. I'm going to confess Him before men. I might be rejected, but I'm going to confess Him before men. I'm not going to be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Amen? There's some people, man, they get up in the morning, go to work. When they get to the work, they work, they act worse than the devils that are there. Because they're trying to be cool. They're trying to fit in. If you really live for Jesus Christ in that workplace, you can count on somebody mistreating you. Now, if you act in the devil, they need to mistreat you anyway. But I'm talking about as a believer. Just because you're a believer, they're going to come after you. You don't believe me, Jared? He's rugged. He don't know. Yeah, you wait. You wait. They will. Because you're bearing His approach. Reproach. You're saying, I belong to Him. And you're gladly identifying yourself with what, you know, some people would call the lowly Nazarene. Okay. So I'm giving myself to God. Now Jesus ultimately did this. He offered His life or His body completely and totally. The second offering very quickly. I've got to move. The Leviticus chapter 2, the serial offering, again deals with devotion. The offering of devotion. Life. It speaks of the life of Jesus. We've already covered it. Because that person, when they brought that cereal offering, they couldn't, they could not say that their life was perfect. They had to bring a blood sacrifice along with that offering because it didn't have its own blood. Jesus Christ came, fulfilled it, the perfect life offered to God. Now he lives his life through me. Let's talk about the offering in detail. Number one. Find a flour, ground it, and sift it. Amen? Call the meat offering in your Bible, cereal offering. Ground it and sift it. It was the first fruits of the grain. It had to be full of corn, nothing lacking. The ear was beaten until fine flour. Speaks of Jesus, that fine flower speaks of the sinless life of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us there was salt, salt. It was to be salted. Salt in the Word of God speaks of covenant. The salt covenant. In certain places in the world, you go to those nations, and they'll want to enter into covenant with you, they'll tell you to stick out your tongue. And when you do, they'll take salt and put salt on your tongue. If that ever happens to you, don't go, oops, spit it out. Don't do that. Because what they're saying is, I want to be in covenant with you. It speaks of covenant. <clears throat> salt has incorruptible properties. That means that it has uh, properties that will preserve. You salt meat, it'll preserve the meat. So you put a little salt. It speaks of covenant. First of all, let me talk about the covenant that it speaks of. It's telling you God is going to keep His promises. The promises He made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus Christ is going to come. He's the promised one. God keeps His covenant. The salt. And in corruption. The Bible says there was no corruption in Him. Again, once again, that speaks of the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. It speaks of faithfulness. 
And then it also says in the passage, in chapter 2, as you go through it, that it's going to be mixed with oil. Amen. And then after it's made into the cakes and cooked into cakes, the cereal offering made into cakes, oil inside, and then oil was put on side of the cakes. So that speaks of Jesus Christ the virgin-born Son of God, the Spirit of God in Him from conception. Virgin-born Son of God, mingled oil, and then oil on top speaks of the anointed life of Jesus Christ. Frankincense that was applied speaks of prayer and praise. It was a pleasant odor. The pleasant odor of His life. Verse, uh, the next one. The next point. Burned in an oven as it was made into cakes. That fire in that oven, burned in an oven, speaks of His inward suffering. You put it in an oven, you couldn't see it. But He went through the fire, inward suffering of Jesus Christ. What is interesting about that those cakes, that cereal offering, there was no leaven or no honey that was allowed in it. No leaven. Leaven speaks of sin. Leaven speaks of corruption. There was no sin in Him. So no leaven was allowed. No corruption. No honey. Wow. You couldn't, you know, it'd be kind of hard to eat sopapillas without honey, wouldn't it? And you get sopapillas. Give me honey. i got to have honey with my sopapillas. Honey sweet. Amen. Some believe that honey is the sweetest natural, that honey is the sweetest natural sweetener there is on the earth. I don't know if that's true or not. For all you theologians, is that true? Here. Is that true? Okay. I'll take it from y'all that it is. But, but God said no honey with this offering. Because honey speaks of natural goodness, natural sweetness. See, there's some people that say, you know, you know, there's some people, you ever met some people, they better than you are? And you're a Christian and they're not? Yeah, I'm looking at you. I mean, they're just so sweet. They just, just have a natural goodness about them. I mean, you got the Holy Ghost and they're better than you are. And you go, wow. You know, they must be a Christian. But they're not a believer at all. They're not a Christian. They're not a born again believer. But they just try to live good. They just, they just some people that are sweet people. But God says that's not acceptable to me. So there's no natural sweetness. You know, you want to, okay. You know, if I just be nice, God will let me into heaven. Natural sweetness means talks about niceness. There's nothing in the Bible that ever told you to be nice. I told you to be a Christian. But your natural ni- niceness or your natural goodness, kindness is not acceptable to God. It's not enough. You know, if we could, some people are so so kind and so naturally good. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we could put them in a cake and eat them? I mean, they taste, taste so good. I like you. You're so sweet. Oh, I want to put make a cake. I want to eat. You know what I'm saying? But God says, no, you can't, you can't put them in a cake and eat them because the natural goodness is not good enough. If you're trying to depend upon your own good works to be saved not as a result of your salvation, but you're relying on your natural goodness, unredeemed, unsaved goodness, to be enough. God said it's not enough. You're not good enough. So no no natural sweetness was accepted. That's dead works. Chapter 3 talks about the peace offering. Now, The burnt offering was the first one if you brought that offering. 
If you didn't need to get right with God, the burnt offering was the first one and all other offerings, the cereal offering, the peace offering was placed on top of that burnt offering. If you need to get right with God, then obviously you started with the sin offering and the trespass offering and then you offered the others. But here we go. I'm almost done. I promise you. Woo. Chapter 3 deals with the peace offering. And again, further light is given as you begin in chapter 6, verse 8 through chapter 7. We have the law concerning the offerings, okay? Gives us added information. Peace offering in chapter 3. Again, speaks of worship of the person. Literally was called the sacrifice of praise. Okay? Now, what you would do, according to the Word of God, this particular offering is very interesting, chapter 3, when you look at it. This is an offering... That verse 1 says of chapter 3 can be male or female. The other offerings, they had to be male. But this one, the peace offering, can be male or female. Which means this, that when you come as a, a human being, there's neither male nor female in Christ Jesus. When you come into the presence of God to worship God, He doesn't say, okay, Brother Thurman, you're a man. And because you're a man, I give you rank over Sister Lori. She's not here, but Sister Lori. Because she, she's a woman. You're a man. I accept your worship better than I accept hers. Because she's a woman. No, God says, male or female. When you come into the presence of God to worship God, you're all on equal ground. Gender does not give you special status in the eyes of God. So unlike the other offerings, this one made provision, male or female, can be offered. Okay, I'm going to move quickly because I know you're getting tired. When you come to have fellowship with God, you come equal as a believer. Remember, these are people who are in covenant with God. Believers. Now, Verse 2, He shall lay His hands upon the head of the offering and kill it. The door of the tabernacle, the of Aaron's sons, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about it. He shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offerings an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards, two kidneys and the fat, so on and on and it goes. Okay, this is why I'm not reading all the verses. Take us a long time to read them. So let me go through it. So male or female, it's an animal. All right? Brought to God. To worship God. The best went to God. The fat around the kidneys, around the liver, the parts around the liver. These went to God. Okay? Again, this offering speaks of a sacrifice of praise. And the rump end of the animal went to God. So the best parts went to God. Now for you and I, you talk about the kidneys and the liver, or parts around the liver and the rump... You might not think that's the best, but in the Israelite, that was the best. So the best went to God. It was offered by fire. And then uh, what is interesting is this. This particular offering, once you made that offering to God, God got the best and it's as if God is sitting down at the table with you eating. So when the smoke goes up, God is receiving the offering, the best. And then God, and this offering invited the offerer to come and sit down, so to speak, typically at His table. The table, the altar of God was known as the table of God. And you got to sit down as an offerer and you got to eat some of it with God in fellowship with God. Hallelujah. Give God praise. <laughs> now, more details again. I'm going to give you the area 
I already give it 6, chapter 6, beginning with verse 8, the laws of the offerings, but particularly chapter 7 and verse 11. Okay? Now, when you bring that peace offering to God, you are actually participating in the offering of it. Sacrifice would be killed. Blood would be shed. And then first of all, you would take, it could be for different reasons. Number one, thankful. You're saying to God, I'm thankful for what you did for me. Number two, you can find this also in chapter 7. If you made a vow to God and you come to keep the vow. Which means you said, God, if you'll do something for me, I'll bring you this peace offering. And because God did something for you because you made a vow with Him, He came through, you fulfilled the vow. That's what the peace offering is about. So thanksgiving or to fulfill a vow. Now, come here, bro. A couple pieces of the offering went to the priest. Two pieces. One piece was the breast. The other piece was the shoulder of the animal. You wanted to thank God. You brought that breast of that animal. You placed it, or that the priest would place the breast into your hands like this. Then he would put his hands, join his hands underneath your hands, and lift, you would lift it above your head, and you would wave it backwards and forwards. Like this. It's called the sacrifice of praise. And as you did that, you would start shouting thanksgiving to God. Say God just, just kept you from dying in an accident. You're waving that breast in the presence of God. And you're saying, thank you Jesus that I didn't die. And that breast speaks of what? God's affection and love for you. So you're waving that breast back and forth. Go ahead brother with me. That's what the lifting up of the hands is. Back and forth. And you're saying, God, from one end to the earth, Your love is upon me right now. When you come in the house of God, you're not just lifting your hands to surrender. You're saying, God, Your affections are upon me from one end of the earth to the other God. No wonder David said, Thy loving kindness is better to me than life. That's what he's talking about. The affections of God. The, the unending love of God for you. Thy loving kindness is better to me than life. David is talking about this sacrifice of praise or the peace offering. The loving kindness of God. And then the next one, you could bring a heave offering. The priest would put it in your hands, his hands underneath yours. You would heave it upward to God. But this piece is the shoulder of the animal. You're heaving it and you're lifting it up to God. And you're saying, God, your government is upon me. You're saying, God, you are the Lord of my life. You're not just my Savior. You are the Lord of my life. Your government is upon me. So I lift the shoulder before God. So now you know what you're doing when you're lifting your hands. And you start waving like this. You're saying the loving kindness of God is better to me than life. God's love is on me from one end of the earth to the other. And if you heave it like this, you're saying, God, you're my Lord. Your government is on my life. Listen, now what does that mean? You're saying, God, you're in control of everything. Your providence. You are sovereign. You are Lord. You are in control of everything in my life. I'm coming and I'm offering a sacrifice of praise. I don't see it happening yet. But because I know you're in control. Everything's alright God. Everything's good with me. Hallelujah. Give the Lord praise in the house. And then you'd sit down and you would eat in fellowship with God. As a part of His offering. You got to eat with God. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Hallelujah. Now go to Hebrews 13. Almost done. Now you know what you do when you're lifting your hands. You're not just surrendering to God. 
You're saying what David said. Thy loving kindness is better to me than life. Hebrews 13. Very quickly. By Him. Verse 15. By Jesus. By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. And as I told you, just as I went through them briefly at the beginning, the rabbi said this is the one offering of the five that will continue after Messiah comes. The sacrifice of praise. So when you come in here, you are fulfilling. Hallelujah. In your praise with lifted up hands. Notice what it says. By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. There it is. The fulfillment of the peace offering. That's what the lifting up of hands means. It doesn't mean just surrender to God. If you've got a good Bible in the margin of your Bible, it will say, when it talks about the lips, it says you're offering the calves of your lips or you're offering the bulls of your lips. You're fulfilling the peace offering. Amen. Isn't God good? His love is better than life. His love is upon me from one end of the earth to the other. If I lift it, if I heave the shoulder, I'm saying God's power is on me. God is in control. His government is in control. Amen. Jesus lives His life through us. The non-sweet offerings, chapter 4 of Leviticus, in more detail. Really, I've already covered it. So I won't give you much more detail here, but that deals with our wrongness. Okay, so remember. Remember. That if you sin against God, you don't start with a burnt offering or a cereal offering or a peace offering. If you're not right with God, if you're out of fellowship with God, you start with the sin offering. And when you did, you're saying, God, I'm, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. You don't, say, you don't say, Lord, I did something. You say, God, there's something wrong with me. How many of you know that? Sometimes you're, you're in tune with that. There's something wrong with me. It's called sin. Sin in you. The evil inclination, sin in that old nature. Leviticus chapter 4 and then in uh, Leviticus chapter 8 deals with this in more detail. Make sure. 8.14 the high priest or the priest bringing the sin offering. Okay, you with me? You start with 6 and verse 8. It deals with the laws of the offerings. Alright, so you with me here? Okay. A high priest, again, I've already told you, is a very expensive animal that was offered by him because of the expense of his sin. A greater condemnation was upon him. A leader affects the sins of people. So a young bull was for the person of a responsibility or the rich person. A goat could be given by the lesser person. Lesser responsibility. Amen. We've already covered about some of the sins that it doesn't cover, deliberate Rebellion on and on. We've already covered the beautiful story of Jesus providing more than what was provided for in the Old Testament. The inward part was placed upon the altar and burnt. Whether it be a bull or a goat, 
the rest was burnt outside of the camp. The blood was taken, captured, and that blood was sprinkled before the veil seven times. The number of government. Sprinkled on the altar of incense and sprinkled on the burnt altar. Beautiful. Because the blood of which we began our message this morning to teach you everything concerning blood in that 1711 passage to make atonement for the sin, atonement for the soul, life for life. They took that blood and they sprinkled it. They sprinkled it before the veil seven times. Sprinkled it on the altar of incense. Sprinkled it on the burnt altar. Sprinkled it. Why sprinkle it? Because God wants you to know that where the blood goes, you can go. Sin separates you from God. Well, that sin offering was made. They took that blood and they sprinkled it before the veil. What God is saying, where the blood goes, you can go. And now, you can stand in the presence of God. Sprinkle that blood on that altar of incense. Your worship was affected by sin. Sprinkle the altar of incense with blood. Now, because of the blood, you can worship Him again. Sprinkle it on that altar outside, that burnt altar. And that blood says, I belong to God. So wherever the blood was sprinkled, it was saying, you can go where the blood is. You can, if you were out of fellowship with God, now you're back in fellowship with God. If it affected your worship, now you can come into the presence of God. Lift up your head, lift up your hands and worship God freely because you have been forgiven. No condemnation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You belong to God. Sprinkle the blood on the altar. Amen. For God... Jesus obviously fulfilled this. For God, He died. Amen. Because part of this offering was given to God. The best was offered to God. And then the rest was taken outside the camp and burned. It speaks of the reproach of our sin, our life. And everybody said, Amen. Now I have restored fellowship. I can worship God. And that blood on that altar, when I looked at that altar, it was telling my conscience. My conscience was filled with guilt. When I saw that altar and the blood and the sacrifice that was made, my conscience was purified from even guilt. In closing, the last thing is that trespass offering. In the fifth chapter beginning with verse 14. And then you'll see it in chapter 7 in verse 1 and on. The trespass offering deals with the acts of sin and restitution. I've already covered this for you. just want to see if I need to get any more detail for you. Amen. This blood here was poured at the side of, of the offering, the altar. Amen. But when we look at the passage, just in brief as I close, in the fifth chapter beginning with verse 14, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul committed trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord. Remember, this is not willful sin. None of the offerings covered this covered willful sin. If you do it through ignorance, then he shall bring forth the trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flocks with thy estimation by shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. Verse 16 gives you the amount. He shall make amends for the harm that he had done in the holy thing and shall add uh, 
fifth part, that's 20% there too, and give it unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. Amen and amen. So that deals with the acts of sin. The beautiful thing is that Jesus Christ, let's close, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, is the fulfillment of the sin offering as well. Second Corinthians 5.21 For He hath made Him to be sin, or literally the sin offering for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So when we look at the sweet savor offerings, the burnt offering, cereal offering, and the peace offering, it speaks of devotion of the believer because we've come short in our devotion. Jesus died and fulfilled that which was lacking. And now when we come and bring ourselves and present ourselves totally to God, we're fulfilling the burnt offering. When we come and present our service, our inward life, I'm going to serve you, Lord. I'm going to live for you. Because Jesus died, His life was offered. Now He lives His life through me so that I can serve Him adequately. Amen. The cereal offering and the peace offering. I can worship Him in spirit and in truth because His blood was applied to my life. Now my worship is accepted to Him. He is my sin offering and He is my trespass. He's the fulfillment of the, the non-sweet savor offerings that were commanded to be brought in order to be in fellowship with the Lord. And so now when you study the Bible, you study the Old Testament and you see those people offering sacrifices, you now understand what they were doing. You can understand the Scripture and you can see what Jesus Christ did for you. And as I close, I ask the question again. Why didn't God just come in the form of a man and just go to the cross and die? Because if He had, you would have never known who Jesus was and what He was doing and why He was doing it. But God says, I'll give you a little piece at a time. Here a little, there a little. Amen. Praise God. So you'll understand. The price that was paid, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and what He did, and what He did for you, and what He did for me, now we can fulfill all these offerings in our life. Not in a literal way, but through Jesus. Go to 1 Peter 1. Holy Ghost is reminding me of a verse. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Obviously, it's not saying that you are literally sprinkled with the blood. What it's saying is that because He shed His blood, you can go where He is today in the Holy of Holies. And everybody said, Amen. Now, when is the blood applied to your life? When you repent of your sins and you're baptized in water in the name of Jesus. The blood cleanses you from all righteousness, all unrighteousness. You get filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the power of God. Blood, the blood of Jesus is the authority of God. So when you get the blood, you get the authority, the name, the authority. And when you get the Holy Ghost, you get the power of God. Brother Mike was a peace officer. He's a cop. His gun is power. His badge is authority. You take the gun off, set it aside, and you walk up, and he says, surrender by this badge. You're probably going to laugh at him and run. 
that badge is authority. But if he says surrender, this is the authority, but the gun is the power, you'll probably surrender. You've got to have the power and the badge. If you don't have the badge and you've got a gun, you're probably going to go to jail. You start telling people, you, you know, pointing at them. You're probably going to go to jail. You've got power, but you have no authority. Okay? But you need power and authority. So, so you'll understand about the blood of Jesus. The blood is authority. The Holy Ghost is the power that you need. And the devil is afraid of that. And that's the way you overcome him. Revelation 12 is by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You can defeat the powers of hell because of the authority of His name, the authority of the blood, and the power of His Spirit. And they say, well, I'm pleading the blood. I'm, yeah, we do plead the blood, but the Holy Ghost pleads the blood on your behalf. Give God praise in the house. Very, very, very quickly, in case I miss any of the symbolisms, I'm going to go through just a real brief paragraph. Amen. The ox of the bullock, a type of the Savior's strength, patience, and servants, and endurance. Hebrews 12, 2 through 3, 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 10. The sheep or the ram, unresistant abandonment to death. Isaiah 53, 7, Acts 8, 32. The goat, the sinner, Christ became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 2. The turtle dove or pigeon, innocence. Hebrews 7, 26. Poverty, Leviticus 5, 7. He was the poor man's sacrifice. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Fine flower speaks of the sinless humanity of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 2. Frankincense, the fragrance of his life. Exodus 30, 34. No leaven, absence of evil. He is the truth. John 14, 6. No honey, no natural sweetness that can exist apart from the grace of God. Oil mingled, born, oil mingled, born of the Holy Ghost, and dwelt by the Spirit of God. Matthew 1, 18 through 23. Oil upon anointed flesh of Christ. John 1, 32. The oven, the unseen sufferings of Christ. Matthew 27, 45 through 46. The flat plate, the more evident sufferings of Christ as seen by men. Matthew 27, 27 through 31. The frying pan, the suffering of Christ that was partly seen and partly hid. Salt purifying aspect of the gospel of those that covenant with God. Uh, no blemish means no fault. The flame speaks cruel beatings and smitings of our substitute. The cutting, the bleeding wounds of Christ. The washing, the inward outward purity of Christ. The burning, the consuming fire of God's wrath. The blood, the life of the flesh. Leviticus 17.11 The laying on of hands identifies the person with the sacrifice. The crop, filtered impurities, rejected food. A pure bird, rejected food food was not in Jesus. He did all that the Father gave Him to do and was sinless. The feathers, outward glory, Jesus pictured here being made shame for us. Everybody stand and let's give God praise. Amen. Father God, we give You all the praise and all the glory and all the honor, Jesus. I come before You right now, God. First, Lord. The precedence first. I ask you to cleanse me with your blood of every evil thought, every evil word, and every evil action. God, that you would cleanse me and purify me because of the wrongness that's in me. Because I'm wrong in my life. God, I ask you to forgive me, God, of my trespasses, my sin. Cleanse my soul with your precious blood that I might be in fellowship with you. That I might be in covenant with you, God. I come today now bringing God and burnt offering. And I say to you, Lord, I devote my life to you totally. I give my life to you now, God. I come to you, Lord God, and present, Lord, the cereal offering. Live your life through me, God, as I seek to serve you. Lord, I lift up my hands with a sacrifice of praise, and I swing it backwards and forwards, Lord. From one end to the earth, I declared your loving kindness is better to me than life, Lord. I heave, God, the heave offering, God, in that peace offering, Lord, before your throne right now, and I declare, Lord, your power and your government, Lord Jesus, and your providence, you are in control. I declare that right now in the midst of this congregation. And now, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, let it be true of each and every one of us as you fulfilled all of this on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise today.